Uh, here's our contact tracing diagram. You essentially find an infected individual, look for people in the household, uh, test them for tuberculosis, see if any of them test positive, and then you go another wider net uh, and look for people that are, you know, in the um, in the kind of friend circle, uh, co-workers, people that share airspace with an infected person, but not quite to the degree that a household member was. So it's kind of this stage concentric circle approach. Anyway, through that, we were able to pick up uh, nine further cases by October. So at this point, we had 11 cases of tuberculosis, um, and BCCDC field investigators were dispatched at this point. So up until then, it had been handled primarily by uh, local health nurses, but at this point, BCCDC goes in. And the first order of business is to try and figure out the source case. You know, we knew the index case, the first person that appeared sick, um, but we didn't know the source. Who made her sick? Um, and did he give rise to any of the other uh, disease that we saw? So we decided in this case to do something called social network analysis instead of that traditional contact tracing of concentric, uh, concentric circles. And the reason that we did this is because this was a community that was facing a number of challenges. A lot of the individuals in the community um, were transiently housed, they didn't have stable living arrangements, many of them uh, were involved in illicit drug use, so there were a lot of um, negative health behaviors in this community. And in marginalized or vulnerable communities like this, contact tracing isn't necessarily the best approach for tuberculosis investigation because it essentially involves going up to somebody and saying, okay, well, name everybody that you hang out with. And if you're asking an individual who's using crack cocaine to say, name everybody that they use crack cocaine with, they may not necessarily be forthcoming with that information unless they be seen as a snitch. And sometimes they just don't know that information too. They might know somebody by their street name, or they might only have a vague description of that person, but it's not enough um, for us to go figure out who that individual is and target them for testing. Social network analysis, though, is a, a different approach to contact tracing, and it's, uh, it comes up with the sexually transmitted infection uh, arena, and it basically is a, an open-ended interview in which you're trying to get not at just a list of names of somebody, uh, people that somebody knows, but at kind of a narrative of, of what their life is like. Where do they go every morning? What are the places they hang out at? What are some of the behaviors that they do? And then as they're going through this narrative about their day, you can start asking them things like, okay, well, who are some of the other people that you see there when you go to this meal center for a meal? Who are some of the people that you see at this crack house? And from that way, you can start um, <laughs> rebuilding a more comprehensive picture of your community than the picture you would get by just grilling people about uh, names of folks that they knew. So a social network analysis of the first uh, 11 cases, we drew out this little map. Um, the color coding here is that people that are uh, orange dots are people that have a smear positive tuberculosis, and this is basically the most infectious form of TB. Uh, people that are white circles with the orange around the edge, those are people that have smear negative TB, so they're not as likely to transmit. And then black are just named uh, contacts. So when you draw out um, and use a graph layout algorithm to draw out this little social network, one person kind of falls out in the center and has a number of connections to the early cases. He's smear positive, so he's capable of transmitting disease. And when we went back and actually uh, looked at that guy, this was an adult male who, as it turned out, had actually been symptomatic for about eight months prior to us even recognizing that TB was in this community and seeing that index case in May 2006. He was a crack cocaine user, so in all likelihood, he mistook his symptoms of tuberculosis, his pulmonary involvement, for just the side effects of smoking crack cocaine. He was coughing, he wasn't feeling very well, he chalked it up to the drugs and not to, uh, to an infection. So, we identified our source case, um, and then we used social network analysis to look for more cases. Uh, and the outbreak, traditionally, TB outbreaks last a couple of years. This one was no different. Uh, this is our epidemic curve, so here is the detection of our index case. Uh, we have kind of an early peak, and then a bit of a wave, and then a second peak. And uh, formally, we say that it ended uh, at the end of 2008. We still pick up the odd case from that community, though. And just for historical reference, here's TB in that same community over the preceding years. You can see there's a, a case every now and then. Anyway, at the end of 2008, uh, when the outbreak had kind of wrapped up, we had a couple of research questions. 
So the first was how exactly did that outbreak spread throughout the community? We had identified this source case, but where did the bug go from him uh, after he became ill? Uh, we did a more advanced form of molecular epidemiology later on. RFLP uh, was replaced in about 2007 by this 24 loci Mirovin VNTR. This is basically a form of that MLVA I mentioned earlier. It's just specific to TB. Mira stands for mycobacterial interspersed repetitive units. So it's a 24 loci uh, genotyping technique. Everybody that's got a colored uh, ID tag down here, these are people that uh, are the isolates taken from outbreak patients. We had uh, 41 cases in total, uh, 37 were culture positive, and 32 outbreak cases were selected for a study. Uh, up here in black are four uh, isolates that had the exact same mirror pattern, the exact same RFLP pattern, but they were pre-outbreak isolates. They had been picked up in the community in the decade prior uh, to 2006. And to show that these are all identical um, and very distinct from what's going around elsewhere uh, in that region, we included some regional cases and their mirror types here. So you can see from this little dendrogram, all these cases are identical, are outbreak and historical isolates, and things that were kind of in the, the larger geographic region at the same time were, excuse me, very distinct. So this is an outbreak. And this outbreak can be traced to this individual um, that we identified through social network analysis. But the problem is when you map out all of the relationships between all of the individuals in the network that were reported through their social network questionnaires, you get a really, really, really uh, transitive network. There's a lot of connections between any two people. I think the average number of social relationships between active cases in this network is six. So everybody was friends with everybody else, and some people were friends with pretty much everybody in the network. So here's our source case over here. Again, I've done that smear positive and negative coloring. If you try and trace out all of the people that he could have infected and identify chains of transmission, it is absolutely impossible with this network. There are just too many potential relationships that could have explained transmission. So we have no idea how the bug spread. And we also didn't know whether a genetic change might have been responsible for the outbreak. Um, you know, we were doing this analysis where uh, we were only looking at a small portion of the genome and maybe something changed elsewhere in there that made the bug transmissible or more virulent. So we hypothesized that whole genome sequencing could help us answer both of those questions. Uh, so that gave rise to the 36 TB Genomes Project. Uh, I won't go into the exciting technical details, you can read them for yourself, but basically we found 204 SNPs separating those isolates from each other. So how did we use those SNPs? First, I'll very quickly answer this question, did a genetic change cause the outbreak? No. Uh, the caveat, we're still poking around the data a little bit, but the pre-outbreak isolates and the outbreak isolates only differ by a very tiny handful of mutations. There's no large indels, there's no really dramatic um, non-synonymous substitutions. It doesn't seem like there's anything in there that could explain enhanced virulence. The more interesting question, though, is how did the outbreak spread? So again, we had this source case. We hypothesized he was the root of all our tuberculosis disease. And what we would expect to see in a phylogenetic tree, if that were the case, would be this guy, our source case at the root, and all the other TB isolates descending from him. But what we saw, to our great surprise, was two distinct clades. So we labeled them, for lack of a better term, uh, A and B. And clade A had our source case, and clade B was sort of a mystery. Uh, obviously, A couldn't have caused the B-type disease. He could give rise to other A cases, but he couldn't have given rise to B disease. So there had to have been a second, at least a second, maybe even a third individual uh, that had B disease that seeded a number of those, uh, those cases. So this was really interesting. No matter what SNPs we looked at, no matter what technique we did, this dual lineage phenomenon always fell out. So this was our first important finding, that something that appears clonal by something like 24 loci and mirror VNTR isn't necessarily <coughs> so, and there's a less problem than <laughs> the good species. Uh, and a clonal outbreak isn't necessarily so, and there's actually a great deal of genetic diversity uh, that we just haven't been appreciating with traditional <coughs> methods. So next, we decided to merge that uh, genomic data and our social network data to see if we could reconstruct the outbreak. So to do this, we basically um, used a series of rules 
cells to whittle out uh, edges from this network. And so we started with the complete social network, and then we said that the first rule that we're going to apply is that an A patient can only give rise to A disease in other patients, B can only give rise to B. You're never going to get somebody infected with a type A bacterium infecting somebody with a type B bacterium. So we can pull out all of the edges between A and B uh, cases and just leave edges between A, just leave edges between B. So I'll use the, uh, the A portion of the social network uh, moving forward. So that was our first rule. We were able to uh, prune the network quite significantly with that rule. And we also apply the clinical rule is that only certain people can spread disease and then the obvious rule that it has to move forward in time and can't go backwards. So we assign people to different infectivity levels depending on what type of TB they had, smear positive pulmonary or smear negative, you know, TB mastitis and meningitis is unlikely to transmit. So orange people are super transmitters, uh, light orange people have a moderate possibility of giving rise to infection in other people. Uh, the white nodes are people that wouldn't really have made people sick because uh, they had an odd form of TB. So from there, we're able to prune a number of other edges. So at this point, there's a number of edges that we can identify um, that are basically the only explanation left for somebody getting sick with TB. Those are the ones that are colored here in orange. So that's our second important finding, is that just by knowing that there are these two separate clusters and not even looking at the genomic data any further, that existing epi information we have, that social network becomes that much easier to interpret. So very quickly, I'll go through the last point, which is that um, some of the fuzzier relationships, cases where even after applying those rules, we still have a bit of a mystery. You know, this person has three potential sources, as does this person. Um, we can use the genetic data to even further refine those. So very quickly, um, if two isolates are closely related, either they infected each other or they were infected by a common source. And if we apply that rule to our network, <coughs> for this individual here, his nearest neighbor was infected by this guy up here. They don't have a relationship between each other. So if you consider this possible source of transmission, this possible source, and this possible source, using those rules, he is probably the most plausible. This case over here is still a bit of a mystery. Um, there's too many potential source cases that are closely related to each other. We can't really rule out whether it's this guy or this guy. So you can apply uh, your genomic data a little bit further to if you've got some ambiguous transmission events, resolve those. So this is the overall picture of the outbreak that we ended up with. Lineage A cases shown with blue, lineage B shown in pink, and blue arrows representing uh, putative transmission events that we identified through those rules. So what we think happened was that a number of individuals um, were sick with latent tuberculosis prior to 2006, and that they simultaneously reactivated. This is not an unusual phenomenon in tuberculosis. Um, in late 2005, early 2006, due to some social or environmental factor, we know it wasn't a genetic factor. And in that community, um, here's a graph of crack cocaine use as determined by RCMP-related uh, cocaine files. And you can see that crack cocaine really came into town in a big way just before this outbreak started. Many of the uh, patients in the outbreak were using crack cocaine. There's all sorts of pathology, lung pathology related to crack use that predisposes one um, to not just exposure to, but also infection with tuberculosis. So this is probably the social factor that caused um, these two or three individuals that had latent TB to reactivate, and they just happened to be operating in a very high risk and tightly knit social network. So once the bug reactivated, it spread like wildfire. So that is my summary point. Uh, genome sequencing is really poised to change the way that we investigate outbreaks of infectious disease, and also with the knowledge we're generating through these projects and understanding the dynamics of tuberculosis, um, we can really figure out uh, not just how to investigate outbreaks, but also how to manage them once they start and how to prevent them from happening. Um, so to talk about some of the kind of follow-on from this work, uh, Marcus Lev will be up next.